Specialty Story, session number 118. Whether you are a pre-med or a medical student, you've answered the calling to become a physician. Soon you'll have to start deciding what type of medicine you'll want to practice. This podcast will tell you the stories of specialists from every field to give you the information to make sure you make the most informed decision possible when it comes to choosing your specialty. And welcome to Specialty Stories. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, your host here every episode where I get to talk to an amazing physician about his or her specialty. And this week is no exception. I get to have a great discussion with Dr. Hillary Ryder, an internal medicine program director at Dartmouth. And Hillary and I talk a lot about internal medicine, what the residency looks like, how to pick a program, and how to potentially stand out or not stand out in your applications and in your rotations. It was a great discussion. I hope you enjoy it. We start the discussion by talking about when Dr. Ryder first became interested in internal medicine. Sure. So I think one of the things that people might have realized made me an internist was that I was unable to make a decision about what specialty I wanted to go into. So um, until um, fairly deeply into my fourth year, I was conflicted and uh, thought I wanted or had high suspicion that I wanted to be a dermatologist um, to the point that I almost applied um, to both medicine and dermatology. Um, but And I think the reason for that was I saw dermatology as no nights, no weekends. Uh, it felt like a lifestyle specialty that I, I could get into. And meanwhile, during my third year clerkship in medicine, I really loved what I was seeing but wasn't sure I could handle um, the 30-hour shifts that we were doing, you know, back um, back when I was a medical student and just thought, jeepers, I don't know how that is going to fit in with the other things that I want to accomplish. Um, what ended up making the difference for me was that I did a medicine sub-internship in hospital medicine um, that did not have any overnight shifts and just ended up falling in love with my team, falling in love with the diversity of the patients and the diseases that I was managing and, and really started to take on more of that ownership of patients, of figuring out what was wrong with them and helping um, either um, make them better or make them feel better or educate them about their disease. Um, and so that was the point where I thought, wow, this, this is so rewarding. It, it may even be worth um, the 30-hour shifts that I, that I may be signing up for. Now, I've had a lot of conversations with emergency medicine physicians, and they have a very similar story. I couldn't figure out what I wanted, and EM had it all. Did, did EM ever cross your mind because of that kind of dilemma? So it's interesting we in internal medicine are fortunate because we're one of the older specialties. Everybody circles through inter internal medicine. Um, but I actually did not experience um, emergency medicine. I did a week of psychiatric emergency medicine and a locked psychiatric uh, emergency medicine mm -hmm. ward. But I didn't actually have any experience in emergency medicine until well after um, I was applying. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, during my intern year as an internal medicine intern was the first time I spent a substantial amount of time in an emergency room as a provider. So I, I, I don't know what I would have ended up in as if I had done anesthesia and had done emerge, you know, all these kind of newer specialties that medical school, school doesn't force you to rotate through, you know, I, I didn't necessarily have experience with. So, um, but it was the breadth of the, um, the experience that I could have um, that, that, that attracted me to internal medicine. Yeah. And that's the big dilemma. And that's one of the reasons I started this podcast is because students are only exposed to what they're exposed to at their medical school. So it's hard to know what else is out there for them. Absolutely. And I think even within our internal medicine, you get such a small slice. Um, you know, I think internal medicine, when you look at what internists are doing, internists are doing primary care, internists are, you know, replacing heart valves now, doing TAVR, and, um, and they're doing everything in between. And so the idea that, you know, that you're going to spend um, six to eight, maybe if you're really lucky, 12 weeks on internal medicine, probably doing some hospital medicine work, some ambulatory care work, and you're going to figure out, oh, this is what I want to do. I mean, I think a lot of people choose internal medicine like me because they can't make a decision. But then what happens is when you're in your residency, 
then you're stuck making another decision because there are so many different ways to be an internist um, that you really have the breadth of opportunities all over again within internal medicine, which I I think is fantastic. You know, I I think no matter um, what your strengths are, if you're a proceduralist or you're not a proceduralist, um, if you love long-term contact with patients or you love short-term intense contact with patients, I, I really do think there's something in internal medicine for everyone. Now, a lot of students listening to this may not really understand what internal medicine is. They may think primary care and go, okay, pediatrician and family practice doc. And they, they kind of forget that there are these internists out there seeing patients. What, what sorts of diseases and patients and pathologies are, are internists seeing day in and day out? So I think you have a great question. And in a way, it actually is going to vary depending on the part of the country that you're in. Um, So I'm in New England, and a lot of our primary care docs are internists. But if you travel more to the Midwestern states, um, you're going to find that most of the primary care docs there are family medicine docs, and that really you go into internal medicine planning to subspecialize. Um, And and I think that is becoming truer. And, you know, I'm not sure that that's a great thing, but Um, So, you know, you can do an internal medicine residency and you can go into sports medicine. Uh, You can go into allergy. Um, You can become an interventional gastroenterologist and, um, you know, work on um, removing gallstones or putting stents um, across uh, tumors in the bile duct system. You can, as I said before, become an interventional cardiologist and replace heart valves, or you can become a geriatrician and you know, focus on keeping frail elderly people outside of the hospital. You can manage patients in a nursing home. You can manage patients in a clinic. You can go into um, critical care or pulmonary critical care and manage patients in an ICU. Um, You know, when you look around, um, the, the number one place that most, more doctors than anywhere else start their training is in internal medicine. And, you know, for some people, it's just a few months. If you do anesthesia or psychiatry, um, um, you're going to do just a couple months of um, of medicine. If you go into neurology or radiology, you're going to do a year of internal medicine. Um, uh, and then, you know, if you want to be um, an endocrinologist, you want to take care of adults with diabetes or transgender individuals, um, you're going to do a three-year internal medicine residency, and then you're going to spend some more time in a fellowship um, subspecializing um, even more in terms of your knowledge uh, and the types of patients that you're going to take care of. It, it, as you were talking there, it's where internal medicine physicians can see patients. I just, I I thought you were going to break into a Dr. Seuss book about you can see (laughs) patients in a home, you can talk to patients on the phone, right? Uh, Here, there, and everywhere. a mouse in a house. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we we really are ubiquitous. And, you know, I I think, um, like I said, you know, we have the advantage, we have a clerkship. You know, I think the other thing for medical students to know um, is that many of the mentors that you're going to see in your second year um, are internists whether you or your preclinical year, maybe your second year, maybe your um, late first year. Um, in your preclinical years, a lot of the physiology and the pathophysiology are going to be taught by internists. Um, you know, so nephrology, you're going to learn your acid base and you're going to learn your electrolyte disturbances, right? That person is an internist. They completed their three years of internal medicine and then they went on to a nephrology fellowship. Um, and so a, a lot of the, a, a lot of we get a lot of exposure to students in the preclinical years, which is great for us. And students get a lot of exposure to us in the preclinical years, um, whether it's case-based learning or, or um, more lecture based. Um, I think what they don't get to see is really the breadth of the types of patients we care for and the type of work that we do. Um, That's not something because it's so broad, you know, we could, you could spend your entire third year in internal medicine and still not see the breadth of what we have to offer. Uh, It is such a, a wide and varied, um, varied career um, that you can have. What does a typical day look like for an internal medicine resident? 
So that's a great question. Um, our internal medicine residents rotate through a variety of different specialties uh, within internal medicine in the similar way that a third year clerkship student rotates through a variety of different departments um, in their third year. Uh, and so, you know, in our program, we have residents who are in the intensive care unit, um, the MICU, for a month. And, you know, they're going to, um, uh, we have patients on the, on the interventional cardiology service. We have our residents on an interventional cardiology service. We have residents taking care of bone marrow transplant patients. And we've got residents in clinic and residents doing home visits. You know, in general, um, I think students know what the inpatient experience is. The interns are pre-rounding, then they're rounding with their residents. They're seeing patients. Uh, I think what they may not see um, are uh, some of the other work that the residents are doing. So, for example, our residents... Um, do home care visits um, with geriatric populations on their mandatory geriatrics rotation, which is a second year rotation for us. We have dedicated rotations um, on medical education to try and make um, uh our residents better teachers because we recognize as we are an academic medical um, program. And so one of the big things we want our residents to do is to be able to teach medical students. And so we, uh, you know, so they, they do some time in medical education. Um, one of the things that all medical residents are going to do is have a continuity clinic um, where they uh, act as a primary care doctor for um, a cohort of patients that they follow longitudinally. Uh, and they're going to do the kind of things that, um, you know, your primary care doctor would do for you, see you, recommend screening, um, follow up on testing, uh, work up any sort of acute complaint you might have, and uh, be your advocate to try and help you become, you know, healthier and happier. Uh, and so they have the opportunity to, to do a bunch of different things um, in, in different rotations. Um, I think the other thing that's important to, to point out is, uh, you know, in medicine, we work in teams. Uh, and so one of the things that our residents are doing pretty much every day, uh, especially in their second and third year of this three-year residency, is, is um, teamwork and leadership. Uh, we expect our residents to be able not only to provide medical care, but also to teach others and to lead teams who provide medical care. So, you know, the resident is going to need to learn how to interface with the social worker, um, to interface with the discharge coordinator, to interface with the primary care physician, as well as with the student and the nurse, um, and, and keep all those balls in the air and keep the team moving forward um, in making sure that there's a great plan of care for the patient and that patient's plan of care is being kind of moved forward um, uh, in a way that's going to benefit them. What does call look like for an internal medicine resident? Oh, well, that is a $2,400 <laughs> question. So it's a little bit different depending on where you um, practice. Um, so in general, you know, call for people who maybe haven't done their third year, haven't done a lot of clinical exposure yet, um, used to be these long-term, um, uh, sometimes multi-day experiences where you lived in the hospital and you admitted a lot of patients that you then cared for longitudinally. Um, uh, some programs, ours included, have gotten away from 24-hour call, um, although many programs still have 24-hour um, call. And so 24-hour call is you're really in the hospital admitting for 24 hours, and then you can be in the hospital for up to um, four to six hours after that kind of cleaning up and before you go home the next day. Um, other so, so traditional programs that still have call, and many places have call in their ICU um, every third or fourth night. Um, you go in in the morning at six or seven in the morning, knowing you're not going to leave until maybe 12 or one the next day. Um, other programs, such as my program, um, have gone to shift-based work um, where there is no long-term call like that. Um, instead, residents um, will stay in the hospital and be admitting patients for a certain amount of time. Uh, for us, it's from um, 7.30 in the morning until 7 o'clock at night. But then they sign out to an overnight team who comes in uh, to cover the, the patients and do the admissions overnight. So, you know, I think one of the things that students should be looking at when they're thinking about programs is 
what um, style of work might work best for them. I think there are pros and cons for um, for both styles. Um, you know, if you want to admit a patient and follow them longitudinally, you want to see how they're doing over the next day, and you don't need a whole lot of sleep, maybe um, uh, then maybe a place that continues to have traditional call might be appealing um, for people who um, you know have families or want to be spending more you know, time uh, in their own beds as opposed to uh, staying in the hospital um, and who, you know, are willing to um, take partake of, of handovers or handoffs, um, you know, they, they may be more interested in, in a more shift-based um, shift system. Part of that, trying to figure out what program to go to. I think students, their their typical pre-med mentality carries over. I have to go to the best medical school. I have to go to the best residency. And they don't really think about fit, especially at this point in their life, what they want their life as a physician to look like. Now, academic medicine, very hospital-based. For internal medicine, a lot of internists are going to go out in the community and practice in a clinic. How should a student be thinking about picking a residency if they know that they they don't really like the hospital, they want to be in a clinic most of the time? Sure. So I think there are three kinds of medical students. There are medical students who have no idea what they want to do when they come into their internal medicine residency. There are medical students who are pretty sure and they're right. Um, they think they want to do endocrine and they end up wanting to do endocrine. And then there are medical students who are pretty sure and they're wrong. Um, they try <laughs> something out and they think, oh, no, no, I thought I liked that in medical school and it's just really not for me. <laughs> if I see one um, more sliding scale, I'm going to I'm gonna run. Right, exactly. Or jeepers, I really liked um, my patient with nephrotic syndrome that I saw as a clerkship um, student, but jeepers, dialysis, dialysis, dialysis doesn't really appeal to <laughs> me, you know, that, that, that some of the disease processes that you learn about as a medical student may be intriguing, but the most common disease in a specialty, you may not find all that appealing. Or maybe someone thinks they're really interested in procedures and it turns out actually when they start to do them, it's not really for them or vice versa. Yeah. You know, we've had students um, come in and say, you know, I knew I wanted to do procedures. I thought that meant I had to be a surgeon, but turns out I can be a cardiologist instead. So, yeah. you know, I, I think what's more important is um, is figuring out um, where you think your career is going. If, if you're if you're pretty sure that you don't want to specialize, then you're going to look at different programs than if you're pretty sure that you want to specialize or sure enough that you want to leave your door open. Um, and I, th- I think the most important thing for a student looking at what program is going to be best for me is, are they going to get me where I want to go? Um, what I tell the students that I advise is, you know, you do not want to be a um, a path maker in your in your residency. If if you're if the residency program you think you want to go to has never sent anyone to an allergy immunology fellowship and you are bound and determined you want to be an allergist, you, you really need to think is that going to be the right place for you? You know, I think you want to consider what is your experience going to be like? Are you going to be with like-minded individuals? Um, are you going to have the clinical experiences um, and support that you want? Um, But you also need to think about, you know, this is, after all, a training program. Is it going to get you where you want to go? And I think one of the best ways that you can determine that is, um, is there a track record of other people going there? So, you know, getting back to your question, you know, I know, I, I think... You know, I've done all these inpatient rotations in my third year, and I really don't think I like the hospital. I want to be in the clinic. Um, you're going to want to look at the schedule. You're going to want to look at maybe um, who the leadership is, um, and you're going to want to look at where do people go after residency. If there's a strong track record of sending people into clinic-based specialties, uh, then you know you're going to get exposure to people who are going to help you get to that next step. Um, you know, if, if you're going to, if the program that you've fallen in love with sends half of its residents into hospital medicine and the other half into pulmonary critical care, the chances that you're going to do an outpatient specialty are not impossible, but the deck is kind of stacked against you because clearly what that program is doing is intriguing, exciting, um, enthusing its residents in those areas and developing expertise in those areas and then using its connections to get people into those areas. What does the training path look like to, to become an internist? 
So if you like, so my, my path, for example, um, I finished my, my, um, medical school, went into residency, again, extremely undecided, having no idea what I wanted to do. And I was one of those students who loved everything in medical school and thought I wanted to do everything and had difficulty choosing. And the same was true for me in in residency. So you spend 36 months um, in your residency program and you should get exposed to a wide variety of different specialties. Um, If you choose not to go into fellowship, um, then at the end of that 36 months, you are ready to practice. And the two places that you can practice as an internist without further training are primary care uh, and hospital medicine. Um, Now, even those are kind of broader than you think. So you could be the primary care doc at a nursing home um, and have a mostly geriatric population who lives in the nursing home and you're providing primary care and and going there multiple times a week. Um, You can have a clinic-based primary care special. Uh, career, uh, or you could do kind of exactly the reverse and, um, uh, be a hospitalist, which is, which is what I do. Um, and a hospital medicine, uh, doc is going to practice pretty much exclusively, um, in the inpatient realm of things, taking care of patients who are hospitalized with things like cellulitis, community acquired pneumonia, um, DKA, uh, things that require the patient to come into the hospital for a brief amount of time and then go back out into their, um, home setting, um, at which point um, the primary care kind of picks up um, the the longitudinal care of that patient. Now, historically, internal medicine, not that competitive of a residency to get overall, but being at a a institution like Dartmouth makes that specific program pretty competitive. What should a medical student be doing to be able to match into a competitive program? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, And you're absolutely right. So when you look at um, the internal medicine spots in the match, um, I looked at the 2019 data, 97% of internal medicine spots fill. Um, Only 42% are filled by U.S. um, seniors from allopathic medical schools. Um, So there's a lot of um, DO students entering internal medicine, and there's a lot of international medical grads entering internal medicine as well. Um, So to be most competitive. You know, I think um, as with many other specialties, we look at um, the internal medicine grade or grades because often there's an internal medicine clerkship, there's a primary care clerkship, um, and then there's at least a sub-I in either medicine or one of the subspecialties. Uh, We also look at the surgery grade. We're going to look at all of the grades, but the surgery and the medicine clerkships and grades are the ones that we're going to look the most closely at. Um, I really believe strongly in a holistic review of the application. And so while we're going to look at step scores as a marker of someone's ability to pass the boards, um, which is important, right? So the um, the ACGME looks at our ability to make sure our residents can pass their licensing boards. And the best predictor of that that I know is ability to pass step one and step two. Um, so those are important. So we're looking at grades. We're looking at scores. Um, we're also looking at um, experiences. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of research. Um, So I think some students worry they're at an institution that focuses more on clinical excellence or QI than basic science research. I I think really what we're looking for is, um, is curiosity is maybe uh, the ability to take on a project, um, leadership in some way. Uh, so someone who, and and really a desire to kind of learn um, and, and do. And so, you know, someone who has done a lot of research in GI and inflammatory bowel disease um, and can talk passionately about that is great. Someone who has been involved in um, medical education, curriculum design, Um, someone who has done a lot of volunteer work, um, someone who has a passion that they have carried out uh, in a way to make the world a better place. I think those are also really important um, in terms of demonstrating that someone is more than just kind of a student doing what they're supposed to. So, So in some way, demonstrating enthusiasm, eagerness, a desire to make the world a better place uh, is something that we're looking for. Um, I think we're also 
looking at letters and seeing as to whether, you know, in the sub-internship or the clerkship, whether the person is a team player, um, is the person able to um, carry a decent patient load, um, what is their medical knowledge like and their clinical decision-making um, and letters or the MSPE or dean's letter um, are often the best way for us to see that. Um, then the final thing, which is a little bit of a pro tip, um, is what we are, the other thing that I'm looking for is, um, am I a backup for another specialty? Because I think the word is out um, that, you know, you may not match into neurosurgery or orthopedics um, and you need a backup. Um, and what I want more than anything else um, are eager residents who want to be at my program. Um, you know, um, I can do, you know, if you haven't had exposure to a certain patient population or a certain disease, I can help you with that. Um, but if you really would rather be somewhere else, there's not a whole lot I can do about that. And so one of the things that we do look at is, is there significant evidence that this student actually wants to be in a different specialty? And sometimes that can be a little bit subtle, but for example, someone who's done four away emergency medicine rotations or um, has 20 published, um, uh, 20 articles published in an orthopedic journals, um, uh, those people really need to convince me that somehow they've had a change of heart and they want to do internal medicine um, because otherwise I'm really thinking, jeepers, um, I'm the backup for this person if they don't get what they want. Um, and, and that's a person who probably is not going to try as hard and probably not going to be as excited to be in internal medicine as someone who maybe has lower board scores or hasn't done as well um, on their, um, you know, their clerkships, um, but really wants to be an internist, really wants to try hard and, and work hard and, uh, and become an internist. Following that same line of thinking for having a backup, right? Internal medicine is the backup. How do you potentially sort through applications where you know that the student is just using it as a stepping stone to be the cardiologist or the G, the GI doc that they've always wanted to be and, and potentially falling into those same pitfalls. Yeah, so I worry a little bit less about that because in order to be a gastroenterologist or a cardiologist, you've got to get through a medicine program and you've got to do well in a medicine program and, um, you know, not putting, not looking too far down the line, but once someone matches in medicine and they want to do a fellowship, they're applying two years later for that fellowship and they're mm -hmm. going to need the same kind of things. They're going to need a letter from me. They're going to need letters from their faculty members. Um, and so someone who says, I'm really passionate about GI, I know that's what I want to do. Um, th they're going to do a good job um, at the clinical work um, that is required of them, either because they find it interesting or because they know they have to, to get them into the fellowship of their choice. Um, and so they're going to be motivated. Um, what, what we've seen happen, for example, if we take a student, great, highly qualified student who didn't match in dermatology, is, is it is very likely during their intern year, um, they may say, you know, I still really want to do a dermato do dermatology. I want to apply again. Um, they're they're going on interviews. Um, they're trying to match in dermatology again, and they're they're not really engaging. Whereas, for the student who knows they want to subspecialize, who matches in medicine as a stepping stone, they're they're on their pathway, and they're still they're they're aiming for where they want to go. And, and we're totally happy to let those people help those people get there. Um, but you know they're gonna because they're gonna show up and they're gonna do the work um, and they're gonna learn what they need to and they're gonna take care of the patients. And you know, like I said before, maybe they know they want to do GI and they come in and they still want to do GI and they, and they keep going and they become a GI doc and Hey, that's great. Um, or they come in and they think, well, I loved GI as a student, but what I really think I liked in the end was taking care of older people. And I think what I want to do is geriatrics and, you know, and they make a U-turn and um, helping residents figure out what it is that they want to do with their lives. I think is really, um, is really enjoyable. It's one of the best parts of the job. Yeah. What are some mistakes that that medical students are making in their sub I or, or away rotations, whatever they're doing as part of their application that that maybe they they don't know they shouldn't be doing or something like that? Yeah, sure. So sub I and then away rotations are two. So away rotations, um, I would say the biggest mistake that 
students wanting to go into internal medicine are doing um, is away rotation. So you, mm-hmm. there are some specialties that you need to do away rotations for. Um, you know, I think of neurosurgery, I think of orthopedics, I think of emergency medicine that mm-hmm. really to demonstrate that you're passionate, you need to do away rotations. You do not need to do that for internal medicine. And in fact, an away rotation can backfire. So let's say, for example, you are a student um, from the mid-Atlantic region and you do two away rotations in California. California. Um, well, those are going to go on your transcript and maybe, you know, maybe that place in California is really where you want to go and you're doing it as an audition rotation. And that makes a lot of sense. You want to go there, you're doing your best. Um, but what that signals to all the other programs, like for example, my program in New Hampshire is cheaper. This person probably wants to be in California. Um, I'm not going to be able to give that to them. And so uh, they're going to be less happy with me than they are in California. And so you can subtly signal that maybe you're not interested in another program. But I do think in a way rotation um, as an audition rotation makes a lot of sense. You just need to be careful and recognize that you're signaling to all the programs you're applying to that you have that interest. Um, Sub-internship. So most um, students going into medicine do sub-internships. I think the biggest mistake is not bringing your enthusiastic game with you, right? It's a hard month. um, And if you only do the minimum that is asked of you, that is what your letter and your grade is going to reflect. I think the sub-internship is the opportunity to do more. Um, For some students, they're putting in more orders. They're doing more independent thinking. They're thinking about a plan of care and creating that. Maybe they're even helping to manage a patient who's become unstable. So it's it's a lot more doing, which I think most students really enjoy, a lot more responsibility. Um, I think the key is just recognizing that um, in a way it is an audition of a different kind. You're auditioning for letters, you're auditioning for a grade, um, and you really need to bring your A game, bring your enthusiasm, um, do more than is expected of you, be a team player. Uh, You know, if an attending asks you a question, make sure the next day you've researched that question and you can answer that question um, and and really just, um, you know, be the A plus version of yourself independent of um, how tired you are um, and what else is going on in your life. Now, in my my main show, The Pre-Med Years, one of the mottos of that show is collaboration, not competition. And when I hear you talk about doing more and being more, I think a lot of students are going, okay, I have to be better than every other student and I'm going to be competitive with them. But then you mentioned being a team player. So how do you work all of that in when students are thinking that there's only one letter that's going to go out that says this was the best student and only student you should accept? Oh, that's that's such a great question. Okay. So, you know, I, I, everybody loves to say there's no I in team. There, there actually is an I in internal medicine. There are several I's. <laughs> um, but I really think one of the reasons I love internal medicines and one of the reasons I personally like um, work as a hospital hospitalist um, is because it is a team sport, um, right? We are working in teams, not just teams of physicians, but uh, multidisciplinary teams. Um, when I say, you know, bring your A game, be the best, you know, the student that stands out to me is not the student who is jumping over the other student to answer questions, but the student who says, hey, you know, I noticed that my intern was really, um, you know, tapped out yesterday. So I went ahead and made the discharge appointment for one of their patients, even though I'm not following them. Now, I'm not saying you need to volunteer for scut work. I would be the last person to say that. But I think, um, you know, you're going to the um, to the cafeteria for a cup of coffee and you ask, does anybody else need a cup of coffee? Um, you know, or you um, go back to that. You, you say, you know, I can update that patient and that family on the change of plans. Um, let me do that. Um, you know, you are willing to, give a try at calling in a consult, especially kind of one of the more friendly consults. Um, those are the things that stand out more than, ooh, I got that question right when the, when the attending asked it on rounds. Um, I think it's really um, demonstrating that you care not just about your patients, but that you care about the other members of your team um, and that you're willing to um, really be a team player. I, I think that people who can't leave their egos at the door in medicine um, aren't going to do super well because really what we're looking for is at the center of everything we do is that patient. Um, and if you're thinking about yourself first, um, then you're not thinking about the patient first. Um, and so, so I'm really looking for people who, um, can demonstrate, um, through word and deed, um, that they care about 
their patients, they care about their team members, um, as well as caring about themselves. You know, one of the things I see a lot of um, students doing in their clerkship is, um, you know, they, they have to study for the shelf exam. And, um, and you know, uh, one of the common um, misconceptions is that doing well on the shelf is more important than doing well for your patients. You know, I think mm. um, uh, a student who is trying to get out early every day so they can go study for them sh- for their shelf, um, that's going to be noticed compared to the person who is is trying to, um, you know, make sure their patient is updated, um, help with sign out if they can, um, you know, see if there's anything else that they can help with. Um, and I, I have to say any day, I would rather have a student who, um, is noted for being enthusiastic, high energy team player, collaborator, rather than a student who's noted for, um, jeepers. They can do really well on standardized tests. Now, as we're recording this, it's a week after Eris has been submitted and your inbox is getting flooded with with applications. What's something, a, a very easy, common mistake, easy to avoid, but a common mistake that students are making with their applications that is an easy kind of gloss over and, and skip for you? So one of the things that I think students are doing is panicking. Uh, and I think if I could say one thing to fourth year students is um, if, you're, if you're planning to match an in internal medicine and you have good mentorship, you're going to be okay, right? You need to apply to programs that are appropriate for you, but you don't need to apply to 30 of them. Mm. Uh, and I think um, it's that kind of over application fervor more than anything else um, that is um, that is harming not only patients' pocketbooks, but also their, their kind of mental um, wellness and resiliency. And the way it shows up for me um, is that I see applications um, for people who I really don't think would be happy at my program. So for example, um, we are a um, level one trauma center um, in a rural, a tertiary care center uh, in rural Northern New England. Um, And we serve a mostly Caucasian population. And I have read at least three applications from people who say, you know, I want to work with this specific refugee population or um, speaking Spanish with my patients is very, very important to me. Um, You know, and, and, you know, when I read those, I just think like, you know, did you look at my website? Do you (laughs) understand what my program offers? I don't have a Spanish speaking population. Um, I do have a refugee population that's, um, you know, 25 miles to the south. And so you're going to get some some refugees um, seeking tertiary care at our facility. But if you want a primary care clinic filled with um, a certain type of refugee population or a population speaking a certain language, um, you really need to think about, um, you know, are you going to get that um, when you apply with me? And, and so I, I really would say, think about what you want in a residency program. Um, you know, certainly look and ask your, um, your mentor how competitive you are. Um, you know, not every, everybody can apply to MGH and the Brigham, but not everybody's going to get a, uh, an interview there. <laughs> um, uh, so, so think about how competitive you are. Think about where you want to be. Um, and maybe you've got a partner and so you've got some, some geographic restrictions. Maybe, you know, you really do want to take care of a certain type of population. Um, you know, make sure that the residency programs you are applying to and interviewing at are going to to, to give you that. And you can get a lot of information on the web um, by going to um, the, uh, the official website of the residency program. You can get information um, from Frida. You can get information from the new Residency Explorer um, that's come out this year. Uh, you know, you don't need to be applying to programs you wouldn't actually be happy at. Um, stick, to, stick to the ones that you think are going to give you the experience that you want. Um, because there are enough of those um, that you can find those and you can be happy um, at, at those at those that you find. Now, let's say we fast forward five years from now, someone's listening to this episode and USMLE has gone pass fail. What in our conversation changes with, with respect to students being evaluated for residency? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So I don't think medicine is as impacted as by the USMLE pass fail as some of the more, um, so for example, neurosurgery, dermatology, um, you know, some of those orthopedics, uh, if you don't have 
a 240 or 250 and you want to do one of those specialties, you're, you're really out of luck. And I, and I think um, if it goes past fail, those people will be helped. The people who are extremely dedicated, but maybe not great test takers. Um, I don't think most internists have really looked super closely at how high the number is. We, of course, want someone who can pass their boards. Um, you know, what I worry about more is this trend of withholding all information from residency programs. So not just the USMLE going past fail, but also more and more medical schools um, going past fail in their clinical years. Um, and then it's it's really tough as a as a um, as a program director reviewing these applications, if I don't have grades and I don't have a USMLE, um, it's, it's really hard to tell, are you going to do well in my program? Um, you know, I, I, I have some information from your personal statement. I have some information from your letters, um, but I, I do think it's important to have some information um, about how someone performs relative to their peers uh, to help the program director figure out, is this person going to be someone that's going to do well in my program or is this person going to be someone who struggles in my program? And, you know, I, I think the the analogy that I um, have thought is a good one is imagine trying, imagine telling the medical school admissions committees, we're going to take away the MCAT and you just need to figure out um, from all these different colleges um, and all these different experiences, who, who is going to, going to do well. So you take away just one data point. I think that's okay. I, I worry more and more about the taking away of multiple data points and, and moving to this model of, well, we, the medical school says this person is competent, so you should have them in your program. That combined with res with application inflation um, really makes my job of figuring out who are the best fit for my program um, a lot harder. Pretty soon, the twenty three and me profile will be part of the heiress, so we can we can see some sort of markers <laughs> of intelligence or something somewhere. Right? Do you oh. have relatives who live in the area? <laughs> something like that. Yes. Yep. Yep. Well, as we kind of wrap up here, what kind of final words of wisdom do you have for the student out there who who maybe wants to do some sort of fellowship training after internal medicine, or maybe wants to be an internist looking to get into a competitive program like Dartmouth? So, you know, I think the most important thing is to be your authentic self and to um, be eager and engaged and enthusiastic and a hard worker. Um, you know, I, I feel like when I look at my career, so many, so much of where I ended up was more of a factor of an experience that I stumbled upon or a mentor whose um, expertise I valued and wanted to work more closely with. Uh, I, I, and I'm so happy in my work as a hospitalist. I'm so happy in my work as a program director. Um, and I think if you are not one of those students who have known since birth that you wanted to be X kind of doctor, um, you know, there is a home in internal medicine for you um, or somewhere else. Um, um, you know, and I think the key is just um, wake up every day thinking, what can I learn? How can I contribute? How am I going to make the world a better place? Uh, look for ways to engage, look for ways to participate. Uh, and the path will become clear to you. Uh, it may be exactly the path you thought you were going to be on. It may be a completely different path. Uh, I think if you surround yourself um, with like-minded individuals and you you know, think about your patients and think about what you can learn and what you can do um, and engage um, that you will end up uh, with an amazing career. Um, my husband always laughs um, because I tell him that I drive to work with a smile on my face, um, but it's absolutely true. My my career has been varied. Um, I've worked part time at times. Um, I've uh, done other things, um, um, but it's always been just really amazing and wonderful. And the people that I've worked with have been fantastic. Um, and I think if you had asked me in medical school what the chances of me ending up as an internal medicine program director would be, um, it would have been close to zero. Um, but this is clearly a wonderful job. And, and I so enjoy um, working with learners and helping people figure out what they want to do. And so I, I, don't, I don't think there's a one right path. I think you just need to put one step, one foot in front of the other and, um, and you know, seek your joy, seek your bliss, um, figure out what makes you happy, what diseases make you happy, what patients make you happy, um, what 
other providers do you want to be with? Um, and, and you will figure out um, what the right place is for you. And, and, and I think that is true for everyone. And I, I think it is especially true um, for internists that, that we are a big tent or a big house and there is there's room for all sorts of um, people um, and personalities and interests um, and uh, expertise and talents uh, in the tent of internal medicine. All right, there you have it. Hopefully now you get a good inside baseball look at internal medicine, at least from Dr. Ryder's perspective. Obviously, there are lots of internal medicine programs out there, lots of program directors with different ideas, different thoughts. But here is one program, a very competitive program at Dartmouth. And hopefully this information will help you figure out how to apply and be accepted to the program of your dreams. I hope this was helpful for you. I look forward to helping you in our next episode. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Specialty Stories. This is MedEd Media. 